So just a little bit, a quick introduction. We have like 30 minutes, and I have a lot that I just want to give you from my life and from my journey. So hopefully uh, it's a blessing to you, and it's a place for you to grab, grab whatever you can and, and run, run with it. So my name is Sarah Lieberman, and I'm a worship leader um, because God called me to be. I wasn't always a worship leader. In fact, my plan for my life uh, included a very high-flying career in high-tech marketing and sales. I was flying all around the world, and I was having a good old time. <laughs> Married to an amazing husband. His name is Evan. He runs an investment firm. He helps people from outside the country to invest their funds in Israel. We have three amazing kids, twins, who are 10, and that boy and a girl, and then another boy. And um, everything was going great until a while ago, God, in one instant, stripped my life, other than my husband and my children, of everything that was in it, okay? My beautiful car, my gated community house, the country I was living in, comforts of shopping in America, if you've ever lived in America, come on, right? Okay. There are two seats here if you want them. Anybody? Okay. Cool. And I'm saying this not because shopping is bad. Can I get an amen? Amen. But because I had built for myself an idea of what my life uh, should look like, what I was good at, what made me feel um, worthy, if you like, right? What made me feel able. And um, God had a different picture. He had a different idea of what that looks like. And in that instance, when he broke everything uh, off of my life, I found myself on the floor night after night in a shut room in my house, crying out to the Lord and asking him, you know, I've lost perspective. I've lost understanding of who I am. I don't know who I am anymore. Can you show me? When you look at me, what do I look like? And that was the question that changed my life. And, and through a series of, of events, um, I decided to do the one thing I'd never done before which was to dedicate my life to worshiping God. You see, when I was a child, certain things happened to me within the church environment that should never happen to a little girl. And I abandoned the call of God on my life. And I, I ran away, not from God, but from what he had for me, for the fullness of what God had for my life. And in that moment where I decided to um, follow this call of God in my life, I heard a voice, not an audible voice, but I heard a voice and it said, go up to the mountain. Now I live in the north of the country, not here in Jerusalem, and the closest mountain to me is Mount Carmel. All right, okay, a few people who understand. and. Um, and I started going up there and holding weekly worship watches, and God started to meet me, meet me, in a way, in a, I had met God personally before, hear me when I say not being a believer, right? There's being a believer, but then there's like that personal, real relationship with God, where God talks to you, and you talk back, and then, you know how King, it says of King David, and David asked of the Lord, and the Lord said, I was like, how does that happen? Back up a bit, but I, I found myself in that place consistently encountering God, consistently encountering God in, in, in worship, and it started to transform my life, and I became passionate about making a space and a place for other people to meet the voice of God, to meet God and be changed. Because I know that that's the most powerful thing that can happen to a person. That once you have that, you grab hold of the hand of God and you run the adventure of life with him. Yeah. Amen? So fast forward further than that, we have worship nights held on the top of the mountain with um, young adults, worship leaders from all across the north of the country. So representing multiple congregations together, coming together in unity, okay? Psalm 133, how good it is for brothers to dwell in unity. It's like the oil that runs down Aaron's beard. It's the anointing 
and power of unity. And from that, we started a program called Ascend Carmel, which is a 10-day worship program. I was going to say the word experience because I like experiencing things, but um, it's really just a time for people, locals and people from outside of the country, to come here for 10 days and um, just learn uh, go to different uh, places in the country, connect with other prayer houses and worship workshops, and just have time to hear the voice of the Lord for, you, for your life. And so that's what we do. So w as you leave, there's going to be these brochures, so you can just hear a little bit about that. Um, cool. All right. And in 20 minutes, we're going <laughs> to pack this in. So what we do is we talk about... Um, the worship journey. It's just teaching through patterns of worship in the Bible, the way that God set it up, the way that King did what King David understood, what Moses understood about life and calling Joshua. All these people had walked a life and, and gained understanding that we can learn from as well. So what I wanted to present to you today is a worship pattern that has to do with keys to your calling and destiny in your life, and that's found in Psalm 24. So if you want to go there with me, if you've ever been around any prayer meeting or worship gathering, I am willing to bet money that you have heard the worship leader sing this or the prayer leader pray this, right? They pray this. Lift up your heads, O you gates. Be lifted up, you ancient doors, that the king of glory may come in. Who is the king of glory? The Lord, strong and mighty. The Lord, mighty in battle. Lift up, you heads, O you gates. Lift them up, you ancient doors, that the king of glory may come in. Who is the king of glory? The Lord Almighty. He is the king of glory. That's Psalm 24, verses 7 to the end. We want, we desire God, right? We desire the presence of God. We desire this God who is mighty in battle, who will come in and bring his glory. But the interesting thing about those scriptures is when you take them out of context, they stand on their own. But when you put them back in context, into the pattern that King David, the ultimate, one of the ultimate worshipers in the Bible, we start to understand something that King David understood. King David understood what precedes these verses. What precedes these verses? Let's look at what precedes these verses. Let's start in verse 3. Who may ascend the hill of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not lift up his soul to an idol or swear by what is false. Remember Matthew 5, 8, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. The truth of the matter is that we can call down the power and glory and authority of God any day we want. But the pattern that God laid out for us to access that level of presence of God is found in this walk, in this principle that King David lies out, lays out for us, which has to do with, with a pure heart. When I read this, I was completely fascinated because it talked about standing on a mountain, or ascending, first of all, ascending a mountain, and then standing in the holy place. If you've been around Faith Walk for any amount of time, you know that first of all, climbing up the mountain of the destiny and calling of your life in and of itself is an amazing achievement. It's hard. But man, once you get there standing and holding that ground, holding ground, actually remaining steadfast and faithful and holding the position that God gives to you in your life. And that could be, by the way, I'm a mom. Being a good mom, the ministry to my children. I think I screamed my head off at them yesterday afternoon. <laughs> I was like, this is great. You're going to Jerusalem. Talk about this. 
We can be in different places in our life with relation to the calling and the purposes of God. We could be holding that mountain just brilliantly in one area, but still grappling down in the valley in a different area of our life. Amen? So holding ground is, 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 is just as important as trying to get to the goal, trying to get to where, to where we're going. When the people of Israel crossed into the land, right, they had to t- take over the land, and then they had to hold it, possess it, in order to inherit it. You can take ground, but if you don't possess it, you're not, not, not going to inherit it. You're not going to actually hold it. You're going to leave, and the wild animals and the other people are going to come in and take that ground that you've spent so much work and so much effort to try and to take. So getting there and standing before the Lord is key. It's paramount to leaving that legacy in our life, legacy for the kingdom of God. We stand on Mount Carmel, so Elijah legacy is a big deal for us, right? So just looking at Elijah's life, he really walks through this pattern that we see here in Psalm 24, right? Because when Elijah walks onto the scene, we don't know a lot about him, but he confronts King Ahab and he says, the God before whom I stand, right? When he came into the manifold, manifest presence of God where he was able to receive instruction from God, but not just instruction, he held authority. He was able to command the rain to stop, and it stopped. And he was later able to pray for rain to come after three and a half years as the Lord had spoken, and he, and, 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 and it rained, right? And many times in my life, if I will spend the time, if I will seek God for what he's asked me to do, if I will buy oil, the... I don't like really the word anointing per se because I feel like it's thrown around a lot, but for the purpose of what I'm trying to say, the the power of it is so much greater than when I, quote, rock up. I got that, you know? I've led worship there before, you know? Let's just, you know, do do the set that I'm in right now. Instead of taking the time and paying the price of the sacrifice to sit before the Lord and say, God, what do you want to do? What do you want to say? What do you want the people to sing to you? And what do you want to sing back to them? When, wh- when I receive that from the Lord and I go out and I do it, there is a significant difference in, 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 in the power, the punch that it packs, the, the transformational power in other people's lives when we take that time to stand before the Lord. After this confrontation that Elijah has, he's taken to what? A season of hiding in the brook, right? Anybody ever felt like they're totally hidden? Nobody sees, right? We're called into these amazing things. We receive these visions from the Lord for our life. And then everybody else is seen, but we're over here. Are you out there? Is it true what you spoke to me? Because I certainly don't see any evidence of it. Elijah is washed by, by the season of being completely hidden, unknown, he had, just conf- he had just done an amazing feat, God through him. And yet God says, right, now you're over here. You're going to be worked on with me, just me and you. We're going to take the time and the season to wait. Many people in the Bible, this is their pattern. We just skip over it. And Moses spent 40 years in the desert, and Paul spent 13 years in the desert, right? Book of Acts, and they went here, and then they spent two, three years here. We're like, yeah, next thing. What, where was the next story? What's the next miracle? What's the next event? Day after day after day after day, hidden. No massive things are happening. But that, that, that muscle of faithfulness, that, that, that those understandings from the Lord are given in those moments where nobody else is looking 
but we continue to serve. We continue to, to follow the leadership of the Lord and the leadership he's placed in our life, even if they're not there and, and even when they're not looking. After the time at the brook, God sends Elijah to another town, remember, Zarephath. Do you know what the w- meaning of the word Zarephath is? It means refining. So after purification, there was another, even deeper, greater season of refinement. Have you been in this place in life? I have. I'm like, God, I don't know if I can take any more. Someone once said that God doesn't give you, I don't know, is this maybe in Israel, they say God doesn't give you nuts harder than you can chew on or something like that, you know? I'm like, God, my teeth are broken. (laughs) Seriously, can I just have some encouragement here, please? More, more work, more refining. Look at what it says in Psalm 24. It says, a man who has not lifted up his soul to an idol. In my life, in my heart, I've had to ask this question many times. Who is sitting on the throne of my heart? God, yes, I believe in him, in Yeshua, in the Holy Spirit, but but what else is sharing space on that throne? Because to the extent that other things are sharing space, there's less space for God in my life. And ultimately, my life is not going to be as powerful. My witness, the words I say versus my actions in my own marriage, let's say, in, in my life with my friends, forget ministry for a moment, although that follows, just my basic life, right? If I'm living what's called a conflicted life, Right? James chapter 1, it talks about the person who, who asks without faith, who has doubt. It says that he will be unstable in all his ways. I might think I have it together in one area, but if I have conflict within the convictions of my heart, within who is sitting on the throne of my heart, I am going to be unstable in all of my ways. That really irks me. I don't want to be unstable in my ways, in any part of my way and my life. So how do we get there? How, how are our hearts purified? In Acts 15, it says that God purified their heart by faith. Now, faith is an interesting thing if you look at it. Because what I believe in is what I'm convinced of. It's my conviction. And my conviction leads to action. If I'm convinced that money is the most important thing in the world, my actions are going to follow those convictions, right? If I'm convinced that what other people think of me is what defines me, my actions will will follow. My words can say one thing, but my actions are going to follow my conviction. And if I have conflict in the conviction of my life, I am not going to be stable, and I am definitely not going to be able to stand in that holy place and hold the position of the mountain of my calling and my destiny in God. Amen? I don't have time to tell you the stories, (laughs) but there are many of how God has worked in my life and what he's done with this message of pure heart. When God first gave this to me, kind of touched my life with this, this message of a pure heart, I said, God, really, seriously? Can you give me another message? <laughs> it's not popular to walk into a room. It's not the rah, rah, fun message where everyone goes, yeah! Love that girl. Totally inspiring and encouraging. It's hard. It's painful, and I've walked through many painful things. But I've learned this, that it's absolutely worth it. 
God has taken me through seasons of pruning. I thought things were going well, and there was fruit from my life. And he, he, he showed me this principle in agriculture, like trees, where even the tree is giving fruit, the farmer has to cut it back so that it will give much greater fruit in its life. I've walked through those seasons. It's painful. It's not fun. Obedience, the way we perceive it is, quote, not fun. But the truth of the word of God is this, that thou shalt not is actually a key to freedom in our lives. If I follow the word of God, if I subject myself to this process of purification and sanctification, I will walk in greater freedom than I've ever walked in my entire life. That's fine. No problem. Obedience. Outside, that way, that way. Thank you. Half of the room is leaving. (laughs) Sorry. Bye. Wow. Come on. These people decided to miss the bus. Thank you. <laughs> okay. If we could just close the door, because I feel like I'm yelling at you. <laughs> okay. C.S. Lewis said, obedience is the key that opens every door. And I can tell you that I'm walking in a degree of favor and open doors now in my life that I never imagined was possible, so much so that, to be very honest with you, I don't even know what to do with it right now. Seriously, I'm like, Lord, I see you working, I see you doing, tell me what it is. It's so far beyond what I could hope for or imagine. Likely, it's even greater than that. Just my mind has boxed myself in, right? I've limited God. But it's my strong conviction that there's no limit to what God can do with a yielded life And I want to see just how far that means that we can go. You see, the presence and the power of God, the authority of God, is drawn to our obedience. Remember what Elijah says when he prays after they poured all the water and the the, 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 uh, sacrifice on the altar? He says, God, I have done everything that you have said. And God answers Elijah by fire. When Moses, it says in Exodus chapter 40, it says that Moses completed all the work of building the tabernacle, of building the place that would house the presence of God. And then what happens? Verse 34, the glory of God is manifest as a cloud and nobody can stand. That is the key to the true authority and power and presence, glory, if you want to call it, of God in our life. That is the pattern that we learn from the Bible. I just want to leave you with two more thoughts before we end. That there is a strong link between purity and power in the word of God. I'm going to give you two examples. In Joshua chapter 3, verse 5, they're about to cross into the promised land to take hold of their inheritance. And Joshua says to the people after he spent time with God, be sanctified, for tomorrow God will do great wonders among you. After Elijah spends that time in Zarephath, all the time, by the way, by the brook and in Zarephath, he is supernaturally provided for right? There's a miracle that constantly happens. Ravens are coming or flour and oil is being multiplied. God doesn't leave us alone in the desert and say, go figure it out. He's with us. He's providing for us. He gives us our daily bread. That process ultimately ends in life from the dead. Elijah, with the spirit of God, raises the widow's son from the dead. That's the kind of power 
that, that comes from being subjected or subjecting yourself to that. When they cross over into the land, God performs amazing miracles for them. What was the initial requirement for that? Be sanctified. Be cleansed. Second Chronicles 69, one of my favorite verses, it says, the eyes of the Lord are searching throughout the land, looking for those who live an undivided heart, an unconflicted life, so that what? He can show himself mighty on their behalf, that he can be powerful on their behalf. This isn't about big things in life. Although I want to see big things in life. It's my personality. But this pattern applies to every day, every moment, the little decisions of my life. Will I live them with a pure heart? And God, God will do amazing things. God will step into the impossible situations. God will transform. God will open the doors that have been closed. God will fling wide the heavenly gates and rush down like who he is, the king of glory. Just to wrap up the picture of Elijah's life, you know, I love these people in the Bible because they're human and we're human. And after this massive showdown, like think about this, fire comes from heaven. And the next thing that Elijah does is he runs away. That is amazing because apparently God can rain down fire from heaven and kill 450 prophets of Baal, but he cannot deal with one woman. <laughs> right? I mean, this is the logic of Elijah's right? Does it not follow from Elijah's actions that this is what he's thinking? But God had a greater legacy that he wanted from Elijah's life. He had Elisha, and he had the next generation. He had all that investment that he'd put in Elijah. He wanted for the next generation. He wanted to create a much greater legacy from Elijah's life than he was the guy who stood on Mount Carmel and, you know, called down fire. I just want to encourage you with this one thing. It's found in Isaiah 26, verse 12. It says, God establishes peace for us because all we have done, he has already accomplished. Can I just pray for you real quickly? Lord, I thank you. I thank you for this day. I thank you for this moment. I thank you that you knew that we would be standing or sitting here in this room. I thank you that you knew these words that you have given me. That you have spent and invested all this time to work in each of our lives here present. Because first and foremost, you desire us. You desire a true and honest and real relationship with us so that we can be friends and partners and run this race together. Lord, I pray that you would bring revelation, wisdom, by the power of your Holy Spirit to each heart represented here. That you would quicken to us those areas of our life that we are holding back. That you would remind us of the joy set before us. That you would complete your work in us. Lord, I bless the legacy of each life here. that they would be fruitful and multiply and advance the kingdom of God wherever you send us, each one of us to, the people that you send us to, the places that you send us to. Lord, that we would continually be washed, refined, refreshed by your word and comforted by the knowledge that we have this promise 
Establish peace for us in the name of Yeshua. Amen.